Okay, welcome to um, the session four uh, of uh, our conference. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to introduce Isabel Garcia Marquez uh, from uh, the Univers Computer University of Madrid. Um, and she kindly agreed to chair this session. So Isabel, the chair is yours. Thank you, Sebastian. And good morning to everyone. And, and welcome to the parallel session of UMAC Universum Conference. It's called New Ways of Teaching Part Two. It's a pity that we can attend both parts, uh, but uh, we'll be able to access uh, later in the, with the recording. Uh, well, you, you know all the rules. And uh, well, I have to tell you that yesterday and today we're having terrible storms here in Madrid. I hope the connection doesn't suffer. If not, Sebastian will help to, to going on with the, with the session. I will be the chair of the session. Um, before we start, let me introduce myself very briefly. Uh, I'm Isabel Garcia, I'm the Vice Chancellor of Culture, Sport and, and University Extension of the Complutense University of Madrid. I'm also a museology professor and I'm in charge of the cultural heritage of my university, which contains uh, 30 museums and now 18 collections. Uh, that they declare, but we have much more, many hidden treasures that will come to light probably when the professors retire. Uh, <laughs> that happening on the universe in this in these offices. I'm delighted if you want to come to Madrid, please. Uh, I will delight to be your host, and you're welcome to come and 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 show you our heritage. Please come soon. Um, and back to the session, uh, we have two, four really interesting presentations uh, this morning and this exciting uh, theme of teaching uh, you know, in this, this um, new situation and really stimulating. I, I think uh, it's about learning with collections of various types and the challenge you, you face and realities in, as I said, in these times we live in. Uh, we have enough time because we are, there are four uh, presentations, but I, I ask you to stick to your time so we have a, a room for, for questions. And without delay, I, I would like to start with the first presentation and the presentation of the speakers. The first presentation is how to create an experimental online science education workshop, uh, lessons learned. Uh, here is Joanna and Anna. Uh, Joanna, um, main Joanna Stimonens uh, from the oh, I don't know if I say <laughs> well this this name the Alaska University from uh, Finland. Uh, she's uh, a biologist, I guess. Uh, her main interest uh, lies in science, education, and outreach activities with a background in conservation biology. And I believe that a multidisciplinary approach, I agree with that, uh, to science education and outreach activities will increase people's understanding of science and other uh, construction knowledge leading to responsible uh, citizenship. Anna, who is uh, here with us, Anna Blumster, is interested in topics related to museum audiences, science education, and museum communication. As biologists, there is a special interest in these themes and then in the content of natural history museums, really interesting. Uh, whenever you wish, Joanna, Anna. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yona Timonen. And in our presentation, I will go through our online science education workshop during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this picture here is a shot actually from our virtual guided tour at our museum where Anna Blomster here in the picture is teaching about the evolutionary adaptation of different species uh, to Northern winter. I'm trying to move to the next slide, but I don't know why is it not working. Okay. 
Here we are. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I will start with the question why. There's something weird going on. Sorry. Some technical. Well, let's leave that what already there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure I can help, uh, Joanna. Uh, what I can do, uh, if you want, is you can send me the uh, presentation. But apparently, it's working. So if if you don't uh, mind, just leave it like that. It's it's okay. I think we'll manage with this. It's not a big problem. So thank you, Sebastian. But um, why we what, I will start with the question why uh, we found this kind of online workshops worth doing. Because one of the three main functions of Uvascular University is the social impact. And University Museum uh, play a key role in its implementation. And uh, in addition to exhibitions and public events, our science education activities um, reach over 6,000 children yearly. And uh, our aim in general in science education is to increase the awareness of science and how science works. Um, and through that, enhance sustainable citizenship. In this specific workshop, we also wanted to increase pupils' connectedness to nature and introduce museums as a source of scientific information. Our challenge uh, was how to compensate the pre-pandemic original two hours hands-on workshop at the Natural History Museum. So before COVID, all the first uh, grade pupils in the city of Uvascula visited our museum every year. And we were able to experiment and learn by doing in our workshop. So what did we do to respond this challenge. I will try here, here, here we go. Okay. We took a leap of faith and uh, offered a collection and exhibition based um, science education online workshops to over 1,300 first grade pupils as part of their school curriculum and as part of the curriculum of university students. Our students were from the Department of Biological and Environmental Science and from the Department of Teacher Education. We trained our six students on science education activities in general. And the students tutored workshops as a part of their studies together with the museum staff. Students were observed by the museum staff and fellow students, and also given feedback of their performance. So how did we arrange the workshops in practice? We arranged altogether 64 online workshops via Zoom, so that each workshop was attended by one first class a uh, great class. The workshop included a pre-recorded guided tour to our museum and uh, short tutor-led games where pupils got familiar with museum specimens, research equipment, and how nature can be studied. The games required physical activities and active participation to maintain pupils' interests and motivation during the workshop. For example, pupils practiced observing nature by listening to a short uh, sound soundtrack from nature and interpreting their observations by drawing what they have heard. Pupils were encouraged to share their experiences about discovering nature. So what did we learn from this? Well, first of all, the pro project taught us that suitable technical equipment and sufficient technical know-how of museum staff 
and and especially uh, school teachers are essential to enable interaction and learning during an online workshop. Second, we learned that when planning and uh, arranging an online workshop, it is extra important to pay special attention to interaction between workshop tutor and participants, in this case, the pupils. Enable and prove pupils' active participation from start to finish is the key to success when working with children online. And this project showed us that educational aims of such workshop can also be achieved online, given that the contents of the workshop support interaction and active particip participation and are experiential and diverse. And we received feedback from teachers, pupils, and also the university students. And they were very encouraging and positive. And we were positively surprised how well everything at the end went. And now I think you have been sitting in the sessions in the morning, so it's time to stretch and uh, be active. So I will ask you to stand up. Now it's time for a natural scientist quiz. So everyone, if you could stand up, that would be very nice. And um, here are the rules of the quiz. Listen carefully what I will tell you. I will go down like this. And uh, I will read some arguments. And if you think that argument is correct, then raise your hands up and lift on your toes and stretch out. And if you think that this argument, argument is incorrect, then squat and be as tiny as you can. So are you ready? Here comes first argument. Only adults can study nature. Is it correct or incorrect? If you think it's correct, lift up. And if you think it's incorrect, go down. So this argument is incorrect. Not only adults, but also children can study nature in many ways. Have you already studied nature? And second one, studying nature helps us to conserve nature. Correct or incorrect? Well done. <laughs> well done, everyone. Uh, this argument is correct. In order to conserve nature, we need to do research that gives us information about nature. And then the third one, curiosity is the most important characteristic of a scientist. Correct or incorrect? Well done. <laughs> This argument is partly correct. Curiosity is very important for all scientists since it makes us eager to find out more about the topic. However, of course, there are other important characteristics for scientists. What do you think? What kind of characteristics are important for scientists? And the last one, now, your own nose is an important study instrument if you are a mycologist. Mycologist is a scientist who studies mushrooms and other fungi. Correct or incorrect? This is a tough one. Sebastian, well done. <laughs> and Isabel, well done. Uh, this argument is correct. Many fungal species have a unique scent. As a result, uh, quite often uh, mycologists need to smell the unidentified mushroom in order to find out which species it is in question. You did so well. I'm happy about that. Give, give yourself a tap on the shoulder. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. No, no, it was really, uh, really nice. I mean, this interaction, because I guess in your project, the, the most difficult thing is how to engage the, the students and pupils in, in online and this, uh, in, in science learning. So congratulate 
Sean, for your work and the and the courses you you have designed and and offered to the to the the students. Now we have time for questions. If you have any, uh, there was a debate about the background. It was a polar bear or, a, or what, what else in your presentation. Uh, uh, well, I don't. It was a little part or somebody's. Uh, 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 have the the right answer, but <laughs> uh, besides that, uh, you have any questions you want to ask to the speakers? Yeah, maybe one. Um, I would be very interesting to form your feedback because you just you presented us the um, what what you did, but uh, can you tell us more about how the uh, the um, the public react and. Uh, was it because we are adults and we are very uh, you know quiet and so on? So you, how is it to interact with the youngest? Um, I would say it went very well because um, the feedback that we got from the students uh, and teachers and the pupils, um, they, when I read them, I, I always cried because I was so touched because uh, they they were so thankful and they they said that it's work it works very well and the children they they were able to stay focused and they were listening and they were so interesting in this topic and and because we 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 asked questions all the time and we had games and we changed so it wasn't um, something that they would have to stay still all the time the children so they were because it was active participation they still uh, stayed in focus and the students the university students who were actually uh, tutors in this uh, uh, workshop they said that uh, this whole the whole thing was planned very well and carefully so it was very easy for them to tutor these sessions and also they said that um, teachers said that it's because it's part of the curriculum of the, the uh, pupils we know that and we know the uh, the what they should learn at that age so we of course we use those themes in our teaching as well so it connected very well with the school teaching uh, program so um, I think it was a success very successful even though we thought that um, it's not the same as coming to the uh, museum and doing stuff by yourself, but uh, we were positively surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, here you have, you have some, you can see in the chat, there's some questions. Maybe you can you can you can you can ask the question, Isabel, on the chat. Yeah. How often do you interact the way you show us during the presentation? How interact with the with the pupils or the students? How often? Uh, uh, you during the one session, I guess, was the question. Mm -hmm. We all the time. It was a continuous all the time. So we. There was a one part that where, where we showed this guided tour that was only watching, then we didn't have an interaction, but we were, the, the video was on all the time, the, the cameras were on all the time, so we were able to speak with the two students like we do at this time. So also the cameras were on on the school, so we were able to communicate with the students. Yeah, I miss one part of the question. Sorry, say what what was the ratio of presented information interacting? I mean, was the what I guess the 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 size of the group that you were interacting with? Yes, it was was a one uh, school room. So usually in Finland, uh, one classroom is about twenty six mm -hmm. pupils, approximately. So there was a one one uh, tutor tutor and one um, technical support per one school. Cool. And it's so. 
no some question I give you thank you uh, Charlotte that my computer is doing with me. Uh, Charlotte, they, they, Charlotte said the workshops were part of the school curriculum and all the teachers of the city were informed by schools. Yeah, well, it is part of the curriculum. So um, there is this cultural learning um, program of city of Uvascula, and there are um, specific teachers in every school that is giving information to all the teachers. So we it's we don't have to market this thing any there's no marketing because the schools know that they will have to book this uh, mm -hmm. with us. So it's part of their school learning. So great. Well, we have to uh, next time you can raise your hand and, and ask the question directly. So because sometimes I miss the questions because uh, my computer is small and I have a small screen. So maybe I need some interesting questions. So if you have any comment or, or, or question, please raise your hand and I can see it. Uh, we have to move. Thank you, Joanna and Anna, a really uh, interesting um, project and I guess you, <laughs> you go on with them. <laughs> and we move to the next presentation. Um, it's called Object Handling in a Virtual World, Creating Virtual 3D Models of Museum Objects for Teaching and Outreach. Uh, here is Charlotte Sargent and Arden Hulm-Beeman uh, from the University of Liverpool. Uh, Charlotte is specialized in digital heritage. Both are uh, specialists in photogrammetry uh, and the use of 3D material in teaching outreach and research. Some areas of expertise include the textual expression or social context of interpersonal relationship of the Egyptian or and Middle Kingdoms. Arden is a thorough archaeologist who originally used photogrammetry to build 3D models for statistical shape analysis of mammalian crania to examine the evolution of traits. Arden founding a currently leads of the University of Liverpool photogrammetry team, which focus on training anyone interested in photogrammetry and developing new photogrammetric approaches. Should we, we're gonna uh, learn a lot of these uh, new techniques. Please uh, go on when you want. Charlotte or, or other Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I can't screen share at the moment. I don't have permission to screen share. If, if you could enable that for me, please. Brilliant. Done. It's Thank done. Thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, Charlotte, I forgot. No problem, no problem. Um, so, um, here we go. Lovely. Can everyone see that and everyone can hear me? Lovely. Perfect. Thank you. So hello, hello everyone, and thank you for having us here today. Uh, we're from the University of Liverpool and based across the Archaeology, Classics and Egyptology department. And Charlotte, also sorry to interrupt, but uh, there is a funny sound with your microphone. Do you think you can fix it or do you have oh, um, is it? Uh, There's an echo. How is it now? Well, it, it sounds a bit better. It's a little fine. bit better. But you can, you can go. Is that is that any better? Not really, but uh, okay, it's okay. We can we can hear you. That's okay. Not okay, lovely. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so we're based across the archaeology department and also the Gaspar Museum of Archaeology. And today I'm going to give a brief overview of the photogrammetry activities that took place during the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, in order to support digital teaching and outreach. So, what exactly are virtual 3D models and photogrammetry? Photogrammetry is the construction of virtual 3D models from multiple 2D photographs taken at different positions and angles. And you can see on the slide here some of the different stages of creating and processing a model from the photography through to the final model. Um, so the 3D models allow students and members of the public to actively engage with the collection in unique ways. They can be virtually and remotely handled in 360 degrees. 
And high resolution imaging allows for closer inspection than is possible in person with no risk to the actual artifact. So they're a really inclusive alternative to in-person object handling and they're fully accessible on the model of a scene site sketchfab. So as the Garstang is a university museum, one of our core aims is to support teaching activities at the University of Liverpool and beyond. It's, it's important to us to share our collections and knowledge and technical expertise freely and openly. And in this particular case, we had extensive virtual 3D experience that we wanted to share and showcase. So we actually began integrating 3D technologies into our teaching and outreach activities long before COVID-19. In 2017, Arden Shun Beeman began setting up a photogrammetry working group in the archaeology department. This then developed into a fully operational research team, which he still coordinates. And the focus is on research-driven learning for students. Uh, the primary aim is to train students in photogrammetry and bring together the various 3D activities taking place in the department and museum. And the goal is to then use these models in a range of different activities from digital preservation to research to outreach uh, and even teaching. So student-built models have since been used in teaching activities. Uh, so these activities have been, have been done with extensive collaboration and support from the Garstang Museum of Archaeology. The team primarily worked with objects from the Garstang collection, and the museum now has over 160 3D models of objects available on Sketchfab, which is a 3D model hosting platform. Um, so many, many of these uh, objects formed uh, core teaching materials for object handling sessions in, in the lab and museum prior to COVID-19. So some of our pre-COVID-19 projects also included integrating 3D models into outreach and engagement, primarily through the use of augmented reality apps. So for the 2019 exhibition before Egypt, the photogrammetry team developed this app in collaboration with the university's app team. And this app allows the user to view selected 3D models using image recognition. So as a result, when the COVID-19 lockdowns hit, we were extremely well placed to support our teaching staff with digital 3D material for remote and hybrid teaching. But it wasn't, it wasn't without steep learning curves. And we quickly realized that our 3D models were being examined and scrutinized to much higher degrees than they were previously. So coordinating with teaching staff so that they understood the limitations, but also the potential benefits, it was extremely important. Um, for example, we can't build models of transparent or especially reflective objects due to the way that the photogrammetry process works. Um, so this meant no glass or highly polished metal objects. Um, and remote teaching with these materials required just 2D photographs. However, the benefits of 3D models were really exciting and we really cemented our pre-COVID-19 efforts to augment teaching with such digital models. Um, so we came up with a number of uh, engaging innovations for digital 3D models. And you can see on the slide here, on the right, we've got a 3D model that was made using a scanning electron microscope. Um, and uh, it's, that's very good for shiny and transparent objects, but it's incredibly labor intensive. So it's not something that we would normally do. Uh, we've also worked on image enhancement of 3D models which you can see on the, on the left there. Um, and this can reveal faded or lost pigments um, through complex image analyses. Uh, so that's more of a research and engagement output, but the method itself, so itself can be used as a subject for teaching. So finally, kind of the most important, but also maybe the most simple method that we've been working on is the high level object magnification, which I'll expand upon um, here. So 3D models can effectively be examined in much higher detail than is possible in hand with the naked eye. The, the level of detail um, that we see on a 3D model is determined by the resolution and, and sharpness of focus available with the camera equipment when you're taking the 2D photographs. 
So as a result, details that are only observable with a magnifying glass can be easily zoomed in on with a 3D model. So standard photogrammetry softwares often don't achieve, um, achieve the highest levels of detailed surface color, but we developed new methods to enhance the resolution of the texture. Um, that's the photographic skin that we see here uh, of the 3D model. And uh, the code required for the, the, these techniques and methods, we're currently working those up for publication. But if you are interested, please do contact us and we're very happy to, happy to share that. Um, so this aspect of the, the 3D modeling, it's been widely commented on by the students, um, but also uh, members of the public and museum professionals that we've been training. Uh, so that's been quite important for us. So um, in addition, unlike handling sessions where students could only see the objects on designated days and designated sessions, the students and users can continuously refer back to digital models that are always available on Sketchfab. And this allows them to refresh their in-person handling experience uh, for revision or, <laughs> or assignments and that sort of thing. So it, it can, it's not just a replacement for actual in-person sessions, it can be used to augment in-person handling sessions and experiences of objects. So in terms of the future kind of um, paths for us to take with the, with the 3D models, we've been reworking some of the teaching material into our outreach and engagement portfolio. So recently, actual handling session at the Victoria Gallery and Museum, and we used a technology called Leap Motion, which tracks the user's hands and you kind of move your hands and manipulate the 3D model. And it's completely contactless, which obviously is great for a COVID-19 world. Um, so that's something that we've been working on. Uh, in terms of other future paths, we, we, um, the development of our methods and technologies, it led to a successful funding bid through the Art Fund. And we're now running a training pro program for museum staff and volunteers across the Northwest of the UK to train their staff and volunteers in photogrammetry. So that's something that we're also currently working on. So just, just to summarize um, what, what we've done and kind of the lessons that we've learned, the, the 3D models that, that you produce, they can be used as a replacement for in-person sessions and teaching. Uh, however, they can also be used as an augmentation to sessions. They've got many different uses once you've made them. Um, However, effective implementation of the 3D models, it requires extensive consultation with educators, both to manage their expectations, but also to expand horizons and new possibilities. And it's, it's really important to then take feedback from the sessions, from the students and the teachers, and then improve our models based on that feedback we've been doing. So finally, digital 3D models can open up a small museum's collection to an, in, to inter, an international audience, uh, and it provides a really diverse learning experience. So that's everything from me. Thank you all for listening. I hope the, the microphone wasn't too dodgy, uh, and I hope it was clear enough for you all. But if you have any questions, please do feel free to contact us and check out our sketch farming account. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, the, the sound wasn't very good, so maybe I, and personally, I missed some information, but I will check it, and you know, and or I will ask you, but because it's a really nice and a uh, project. I mean, with a lot of collaboration with museum outside, and I guess that the, the uh, we need to share this. This uh, you can share these smaller ones that you are. Uh, done it. I mean, because uh, somebody said in the chat that it must be an, an expensive uh, technology or, or or difficult to, I mean, you are an expert and, and your colleague, but maybe it's not uh, available for, for everyone. But it's nice that you share these, these, these models and, and you're uh, building these networks because it's a, a great uh, resource for, for teaching. So we yeah. have, um, uh, do you have any questions? We have time for two minutes for questions. If you... So just, Andrew. just. <laughs> ah, Charlotte, you, you want to answer? Uh, uh, yeah. just... oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, I'm, I'm really interested in what you've presented there, um, Charlotte. Um, I, I did struggle with the sound too. You sounded a bit like a Dalek. <laughs> and I thought I was going to be exterminated um, during the presentation. But I'm, I'm really interested in whether there's been any sort of studies of the pedagogy uh, that com compares the, the sort of teaching methods with, um, with uh, 3D surrogates with the real material and things like that. Have you got um, people in your education department at your university looking at, uh, at you know, how effectively you can use, um, use the objects? No, so that's, that's actually something that we're working on at the moment uh, and we're looking to kind of research and publish. Um, we have had some kind of um, immediate feedback from the students that they're actually able to examine the objects in ways that they wouldn't be able to in handling sessions. So they really enjoyed that, that aspect of it. Um, in terms of how effective, it was a great um, kind of alternative during COVID-19 to in-person object handling. Um, and uh, in, in terms of the actual um, kind of research into that sort of thing, it's still very much in the, in the early stages. Um, I know that my, my colleague, Arden, he, he's done more work on this sort of thing. Um, but uh, but at, at the moment, we know it's been very effective um, and in both as, as a replacement for, on, uh, for handling sessions and also as an augmentation. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I've, I've been in the situation when I was teaching a couple of years ago where I was running external classes with um, virtual objects and then using the same objects in, um, you know, face-to-face -face classes. Anyway, look, I'd, I'd love to, I'll send you an email. I'd love to talk more about, uh, about some of the um, pedagogy issues with it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, I was just going to say, there's been a couple of comments about, um, about it being very complicated and expensive, and that's not necessarily the case at all. You, you can make it very, very expensive and complicated, but you can also do photogrammetry with your mobile phone camera, and there's also free software out there. We work with, with a software called Agisoft Metashape, um, and it's, it's an educational license that we have, so it's a, it's a £500 investment. But beyond that, you can use whatever camera equipment you have available to you. Um, and it's something that we're currently working on with museums in the Northwest, how we can create 3D models for minimal expense. Um, so that's, that's something that's quite important to us to kind of spread the message that um, 3D models don't have to be expensive. But it all depends on, on what you're using the 3D models for. Um, if you're using them for archiving, then you'll need to spend a lot more money on your equipment because you'll need to capture certain details in the 3D model. If you're using them for public outreach and engagement, it's less important to capture those details. So you can use less expensive equipment. Uh, and that's for for archaeology, uh, paleontology, and and restoration, we use it a lot. And as you say, you, you use a SketchUp also. This is really, you know, very uh, it's available and and for teaching, it's, it's, it's easy to to use. Okay, thank you very much a lot. Maybe we have to move on. Sorry, you can. We have the, uh, her address uh, available. The Book of Astrak, sure, they're going to contact you and our colleagues because it's really nice uh, project. We move to the third uh, presentation. Uh, here from uh, title is Diversidades Collection, a university collection of photography at the service of training, future audiovisual communication professionals. Here is Carmen Francisco, I, I saw him, um, and Marta. Uh, Carmen is a doctor from the University of Salamanca. She was a researcher in the project A Million Pictures, Magic Latin Slide Heritage as Artifacts in the Common European History of Learning. Her research is focused on fields of, of uh, cultural heritage, archaeology, and history of science. Francisco Javier Frutos Esteban is professor at the Department of Sociology and Communication at the University of Salamanca, where he teaches photography, media history, and social studies of science. His research is focused on communication history, photo photography, and media psychology. And Maria Cerezo Prieto is a researcher in training through the 
is a researcher. Uh, she's doing her PhD and currently uh, is doing her PhD at the University of Salamanca uh, at the doctoral program education of the Knowledge Society, uh, whenever you want, uh, Carmen. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I have problems. Uh, uh, now it should work, huh? Because I put it to co-host, but uh, oh, thank no. you. Mm -hmm. no, it's Could you see my, oh, my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thank, thank you for joining us today. Fine. Excuse me. <laughs> oh. uh, First, Francisco Javier Frutos, Marta Cerezo, and I would like to thank the University for organizing this very successful conference and for giving us the opportunity to present our work. Uh, uh, sorry, can I hear you? Echo, echo, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. We still have some echo. Uh, maybe you have something else open in your, do you have two, do you have your, I don't know. But it's okay and you can go on. Hello, <laughs> I'm going to use my- That's perfect, this is perfect. This is perfect, okay. Yes. yes. Hi, our work is, Entitled Diversidades Collection, a university collection of photography at the serving on training future audiovisual communication professionals. As I mentioned, Diversidades Collection is a university collection whose first edition was launched in uh, 2014 and is currently ongoing. This challenge is combines as an action integrating into the experience of responsibility research and innovation, photo stress, detention, creativity, and care. Our initiative promotes community health in terms of diversity, inclusion, and equity through the systematic use of collaborative photography, teaching, innovation, ethnography, inquiry, cultural creation, and heritage education. Additionally, it is an experience that is defined by its theoretical methodological orientation. It is based on practices of participant action research, such as its basis community development, a scholar, a scholarship of teaching and learning, project based learning, service learning, and photo voice. All of them are to promote the co education by means of the practice of the photographic portrait. Two general objectives that diversity is specifically proposed to the development of and ethnophotography are to investigate the construction of identities and the promotion of the co-education access sexual diversity in high uh, academic contexts. In this way, we develop diversidades in the Faculty of Social Sciences of the Salamanca University, specifically with undergraduate students of audiovisual creation and communication and sociology. I'm glad to say that more than 700 students are estimated to have take, taken part in this initiative since it began and the 1,200 images that have been produced 
this year currently make up the Diversidades collection. For instance, in the eighth edition, 2020 and 21, 105 students have been involved of Diversidades achievement. Around 60% belong to the audiovisual creation and communication degree, and the remaining 40% from the bachelor degree of sociology. They have taken more than 147 photographs and 17 audiovisual capsules. Let's move on the organization of this collection. Diversidades is structured around two different types of activities collection preservation and dissemination. In order to preserve the collection, first of all, Diversidades is integrated in the network of scientific collection of the University of Salamanca. All the photographs produced along the different editions are open access through the institutional web repository, which is maintained thanks to collaborative management. With regard to the dissemination in parallel to previous point, the public diffusion of the action diversidades take place by the incorporation of the images created in virtual galleries such as Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Also, the students prepare making of about their individual project and photo book that present the result of each edition. In addition, they select 25 photographs with the objective of shaping a collective and itinerant exhibition. Diversidades website gathered the scientific collection of photoethnography, indexes those images from a controlled vocabulary of folk sonomies in the line with the participatory spirit of the initiative, which has also been developed and evaluated by the student themselves, teacher, and research. Now, we can highlight five concepts uh, of diversidades as a result of eight years of work. That is, to promote cooperative photography as a way of photography that configures the visual photography of the collective and the acronic memory of the project members. To connect teaching, innovation, apply research and implementation of active teaching learning methodologies in higher education thanks to the development of a scientific collection of photography. To raise awareness of the value of photographic images in order to think about gender identity and sexual diversity as a public controversy with great social relevance. To design coordinated activities between the subject of the different degrees courses involved. And finally, in this context, to spread the result obtained face-to-face -face or online activities are developed. In this way, the reception of the project is facilitated by all kinds of audience. From now on, I will show you representative images of the result of the student work from the different edition. This slide shows a picture of the first edition, which was implemented in 2014. This is the slide of the second edition. The third edition. The fourth edition. The fifth edition. The sixth edition. the seventh edition and the eighth edition corresponding to 2021 was a little bit different. We couldn't organize an on-site ex exhibition because of the restriction caused by the COVID pandemic. However, managed to organize an online exhibition with a catalog of the selected photos and its group of work could present a making of related all the processes. And now we are already working for the ninth edition of Diversidades Collection 2022. And our first activity is the first forum, Diversidades Photoethnography, Identity and Co-Education. It is an open webinar made up 
of four discussion forums and eight seminars that promotes the co-education into the framework of the higher education as one of the fundamental pillars of our public health. To conclude, we are very happy to share with all of you about our work. Uh, yesterday evening, in the first video club session, it was to be presented the audiovisual uh, what been prepared for this conference entitled Diversity Collection 2021 Photography, Identity and Sexuality. I'm very sorry because I couldn't stay yesterday, but I, we hope you like it. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, yeah, we have these, these links that I share, uh, Marta shared for us to see the, the video if we, we couldn't see or, or, or it will be in YouTube so we can see the video, really interesting uh, project. Sorry, I couldn't see yesterday. I have a flood in one of our museums, but, but nothing major. Um, uh, we, we, we are really short of time because we had this, this uh, material available and, and Marta and uh, there are many comments on, on how uh, interesting was the, the, the project because the students uh, were engaged and really raising this um, a subject that really very actual, I mean, the, the diversity, inclusion, equity, how they, they face it and, and how they resolve these, these challenges is, is, is a good example for, for us. Uh, and congratulate for your, for your initiative that is going on on, the, on time. Uh, Salamanca is the oldest uh, university in Madrid and it has really also nice collections. And, and new ways to, to see them that they are uh, you know, sharing with us. Thank you, Carmen. I don't know if there's uh, uh, just one question or, or we move to the last one. I mean, the, the president. Yes, yes, that, yeah. <laughs> yes please. Just, just a quick question. Sorry. Um, because of the, the video, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch, in fact, that it was the, I, I understood it was a student's uh, exercise and so on. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm mixed. I'm mixed with the um, with the um, with the fact that you send it for for the conference. So it was in fact instead of the exhibition, uh, the on-site exhibition, they made this uh, this video uh, to present their to present that work. Am I correct? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But I just wanted to make sure about that because um, I didn't get that very. Um, it mixed in my brain. Sorry. Maybe I was too tired and so on. But. Uh, Okay, no, but it's it's great work. Huh? It's uh, it's very impressive. And how many? How much? Um, my question would be: How much? Um, uh, how many? How many professors? Uh, how how independent are they? Are they all, are they doing everything, or are there you know uh, teachers uh, next to them? Because in the video, you I don't think we see any teachers or so. On. So it's only students. Yeah, it's because, uh, thank you very much for all your feedback. And thank you, Isabel. Um, uh, thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> and uh, the project started in 2014. And at the beginning, only one um, faculty was involved, uh, audiovisual communication. And the, at the beginning was one teacher only, Francisco Javier Frutos. And um, a lot of people was involved in the project. And he thought it was very good involved to other teacher uh, from sociology. And now they are involved some different, different people from uh, sociology and communication, audiovisual communication. And there are different subjects involved and different type of student because there are students from the subject of photography and there are students from sociology and I and some students from history too and there are a mix and every year is involved more people in the project. I don't know if I replay the question. 
I can I can what? say you perhaps there are four or five teachers depending yeah, yeah. on the 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 yeah and we are ordering some uh, support from the university to continue the, every year and uh, the the project has a very nice um, I don't know everybody likes because. At the beginning was uh, the result of the of the student. Uh, Javier thought uh, it was a very nice idea to make an exhibition because uh, the project the, the the project of the student have uh, visibility, and they was very very happy uh, with the exhibition. And at the end, uh, it's a I think it's a nice project with. Uh, a continuity and um, you know <laughs> great thank you and um, thank you we have to move on great a uh, collaborative project and uh, sure you we can contact you in, in in the address we have in in at the Astrad. Uh, before the president snack me we're gonna move on to the next presentation last presentation of, of this session uh, but uh, not the least, of course, uh, is uh, called Engaging the University Community in Informal and Non-Formal Geoscience Education in South Africa, an example, really interesting. Here is Tania Reinhardt, is uh, the Science Center Coordination uh, and was an instrument in establishing the center in, in 2008. Tania is responsible for the Science Center, the Geology Education Museum Collection, on the development of the delivery of workshop and science show, shows. Her interests include geoscience, education, and science communication. Uh, thank you, Tania. Very interesting from what I wrote, from what I read in the abstract. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing you, of course. Um, this is uh, this is technology. Thank you very much, Isabel. And um, sorry, I'm I'm standing between uh, you and lunch now, so I'll try to keep it as short uh, and sweet as possible. And let me just share my screen. So we've all heard about you know all these fan fantastic and wonderful um, uh, uh, things that happened um, pre-COVID and uh, uh, sorry post-COVID or while while COVID was happening. Um, and now, basically, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to to basically go before the COVID session when you know there there was um, still these very happy times and uh, and uh, yeah so so happy times so I'm going to show you something about or tell you something about that our involvement so just a little bit of background because I'm pretty sure uh, nobody has heard of the geology education museum at the University of KwaZulu Natal we are based in Durban on the beautiful east coast of South Africa oh, God. And again okay so we opened our door in 1948 uh, to house rock mineral and fossil collections as part of the former University of Natal's uh, geology department so um, in an establishment, um, we, we had two universities here um, in, in Durban and the, uh, the country decided that it's time for a, a reshuffling and so on. So we had a merger uh, of the two universities to, uh, in 2004 to form the University of KwaZulu Natal. And um, so there it was decided to basically um, have a, 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 sorry, a science center. And since 2008 now, the Geology Museum is incorporated in the Science Center. And here you can see photos of the, of the Science Center. And if you have your camera on, you see the back side of it. I'm basically sitting with my back to the museum section. Um, as mentioned, uh, my, my passion is, is geoscience, um, but we also do any other science subjects here in the Science Center, but uh, particularly this one here is my, my aim is to promote science communication and engagement and public awareness of geosciences. And here you can see me uh, in those happy days when uh, COVID was a, wasn't a problem um, at one of my workshops. So just to put things into perspective we are a small science center so that means or a, a small museum that means we have 1.5 uh, permanent staff members um, i'm the one and my colleague is the half and um so 
of course, funding is always a problem. So, so money is also not, not that great. So we rely heavily on the university community um, to contribute. And we've seen um, university, the university community contributes in all, in all sorts of different areas. In our particular case, um, so uh, in the informal and non-formal sections, um, and they assist us in in-house projects as well as outreach projects. And here you can see the ticks that we have here um, right next to the, to the various aspects that they basically um, gonna contribute to. But I just want to focus on, on, on a few to just to highlight uh, things. So, so the posters, of course, uh, the geology website, the educational resources, and then last but not least, exhibits and models. So let's just dive into it. Um, so again, post a series, and I'm pretty sure that every uh, or a lot of uh, university museums um, get contributions from staff members. So here we have our um, uh, geolo geological hazard post series with uh, lots of contributions from staff members in terms of contents and so on. And we were very proud to be selected uh, that the tsunami poster was selected to be distributed uh, to, to thousands of schools. Um, in South Africa. So that was one of the, the great successes that we had. Also, um, South Africa, of course, is well known for its very rich geological heritage, but we wanted to keep it local. So um, there was, we developed uh, resources, geological resources spe specifically to, to KwaZulu Natal. And uh, so we started off with the English poster. Again, uh, a huge contribution from staff members. And then later on, um, because I'm not too sure if everybody is aware, um, South Africa has 11 official languages and um, to reach each and everybody, uh, you need to translate these ones because often they, they uh, have very limited understanding of, of English. So uh, an easy Zulu version was, uh, was uh, uh, made, uh, available. And again, the translation actually uh, was done by postgraduate students, uh, geology students. So very great effort from their side. Then, of course, you want to show people things. Um, so they, they and uh, we developed a, a rock box. Um, again, the sample collection was done by staff and all the, the nitty grits and pieces, the rock crushing, the labeling, the as assembling of the, 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 the boxes and so on was done by, by students. And I'll just give you, uh, I'm going to show you a live one just now. So again, a very uh, important resource uh, that we were able to dish out to hundreds of schools here in KwaZulu Natal and also uh, in other parts of the country. Websites, of course, is the new you. And um, so in COVID, luckily, and here we, we have the COVID link, um, uh, helped, uh, gave, gave me some time to, to basically upgrade the geology of KwaZulu Natal website, the English version. And we hope again, with the help uh, uh, of staff and students uh, to be able to launch uh, an easy Zulu version in 2022. Um, one of the things that is, is really great is if, you, if, you, if you're working almost all by yourself is, is um, you know, to bounce off ideas and so on. And again, um, if you have very dedicated staff, um, that is really, really great. So this is one of our exhibits that we've done for our informal uh, informal outreach exhibits that we've done at SciFest Africa, the biggest science festival here in Southern Africa. And um, so the artwork was done uh, by members of, of, of staff. Um, the technical support. So, so we basically designed a tunnel and uh, on site, uh, we had staff members uh, uh, putting up the tunnel, uh, installing, uh, for example, um, you know, the, uh, the air conditioning to, to make it really feel cold. And you see, uh, we, we have, uh, there was ice, uh, some, some part of ice, uh, ice ages here in Southern Africa at one point. So to get people also the, the, the feeling for it. Uh, another great project was our tsunami model. Also, again, uh, part of as an informal outreach exhibit for the Science Fest, uh, Science Fest Africa Science Festival, and um, which was a very, very big success. It was just uh, after the and uh, after the time when the when the big uh, December tsunami happened. So, um, and people were very, very interested. Again. 
with the design exhibit, the building of the exhibit, uh, our staff members was involved with the presentation, for example, at, at Southwest Africa, we had students, we had staff members basically demonstrating the model. A different approach was, uh, this was actually quite, was, was quite interesting. Um, so students often have to write assignments on specific subjects. And I got approached by a lecturer in the, in the geology department who wanted basically something different. So not that the students write their exam, uh, write, write uh, uh, some, some report and so on, and, and then it sits there. So we came up with the idea um, of that the students make models for the science center. So for us, of course, uh, we need to change and upgrade the exhibits and so on. It was a great opportunity to get uh, our hands on new exhibits. And of course, uh, we don't have money to buy exhibits. So um, also a great opportunity. Uh, on the student side, basically, um, what we found also is that the students have often very limited understanding of, of three dimensions. So we hope that, you know, by, by involving staff and uh, involving the students with the, with the models, they, they might get a better understanding and also uh, provide um, a motivation because we're going to put it on display. And these was uh, just some of the very few results. Um, so one is basically a mining technique model, um, a room and pillar model that the students came up with and that is still sitting in the Science Center today, and also some uh, mining shaft models. Um, again, I, I was very impressed with it, with it, with the creativity of, of, of the students, uh, uh, students' approach, and each year the models got better and better. Again, for us, the advantage is new exhibits at very low cost on a regular basis. And also for the university students, because they had to work in groups, they got exposed to real world situations. Also, they had to physically, because they were making the models themselves, physically work in three dimensions. And very important, they were motivated to do the research because their exhibits were on display. So we saw students bringing in their, their colleagues and their friends and so on to show them, oh, here is our model, this is what we've done. So they were, took, took ownership and were very proud of it. Okay, so just to wrap it up, um, a very big assets in terms of, especially for smaller muse university museums is, is other staffs and students. And they can contribute um, to, to a lot of different, different areas, development of educational materials. So we've seen posters, educational resources, websites, also with exhibit and model development, um, or in, uh, initiating research lab visits and talks and lectures. So, and I'm pretty sure that you're all familiar with this. Again, also university students can contribute to assisting with visitors, workshops, translations, and also with the exhibit of model development. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into this. This is just a big thank you to the university community for supporting the museum and the center. And here you can see some low key uh, input. Um, here they were cutting out dinosaur masks for one of my workshops. And again, a big thank you to the university community. And that was it from my side, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Very impressive, congratulations. You have done a lot of things with, with the uh, scarce uh, resources with uh, almost you. I mean, you motivate many people, and this is a really um, a great job. I mean, really, it's amazing. Uh, it's not easy that that heritage geology to make it accessible to to the community, and, and what we have seen. I mean, it's a really nice exhibit activities and 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 your proposals. Uh, congratulations for these, these projects. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Uh, do you have any question? We have one question. <laughs> I know I'm, I will be the worst chair in the world because we... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry again, I'm, I'm sorry. standing, I'm standing. <laughs> You and your, so your lunch. Interesting that, that I mean I will be here uh, the whole morning. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, I, I just uh, thank to everybody to, to be here. Uh, there, there, is for, the there is one question for Natalie. There is one question for Natalie Isabel. Oh. Yes, thank word. you, thank you, Tanya and Isabel, and so on. Uh, I had a very prosaic question for Tanya because. I'm still uh, thinking to my talk for tomorrow. And so uh, 
<laughs> Tania, do you have an idea of the monetary value of your geological collection of samples? Um, unfortunately not, uh, and I, I, this is totally to blame on me. Um, there have been uh, evaluation processes going around uh, to investigate in, in ge the geological collections and, and find the monetary value, but so far, up to up to date, I, I haven't contacted the, uh, the right person, but this is on my on my to do list. Lose it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, that's almost impossible. I mean, you have <laughs> to do that work. I mean, it's yes, it changes every day, but you can try to do it at least. Yeah. Was... No, no, no. I mean, but you would have to get an expert in because I mean, it's uh, it's one thing to to look at the minerals, so there there might be a value, but uh, for for uh, geological specimens as as such, it is very difficult to to say, okay, this rock uh, is very valuable. This rock isn't very valuable. So. Uh, it is it is very difficult it's not like art or something like this where you can put a price tag onto it mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you uh, to all of you and well we have a break so you can you can have lunch and continue with this this uh, great conference and with these uh, presentations that you know we're all here we can see each other next year but but now we're in touch and it's really a good thing we made it possible. Thank you, Sebastian. And, and all Thank the you, Isabel. And just before everybody's leaving, um, remember that I want to make a group photo. Huh? So, oh, and now I can see the contest is started huh? because we have lots of wonderful backgrounds. Excellent. Okay, so those who can, please turn on your video. Oh, it's so great to see the faces in any case. Yes, thank you. And then, okay, because I have two screens, so I have to do it twice. Yes, Charlotte, good. Elena, we can't see you, you just disappeared. Come back, Elena, you were just like a, yeah. Okay, Okay. good. Luke is, Luke is coming with me, you see. Luke? Ah, yes. Hello, Hug. Oh, oh, they're so, so sweet. Good. Oh, so cute. Yes, so they cute. are. Yes, this is the, the wonderful couple of Humak, huh? <laughs> the best, <laughs> the best one. Respect. He was the chair of Humak before. He was okay. the chair of Humak. Respect. And, yeah, of course. I Come on, I spent all my, my life respecting Hug. And remember, I, rem I, I managed the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Natalie is uh, our treasure. Okay, so right? now everybody's ready for the picture. They don't care about our discussion, <laughs> personal life. <laughs> okay, um, wave, smile, are you ready? Great. Okay, once again. We could actually do that thing that we invented in uh, Kyoto, which is the symbol of university museums, right? You. No, in fact, Miami, because this is actually copied by from the University of Miami. Okay, it's good. Very good. Once again, you ready? Smile. Very good. Thank you so much. And we have some brilliant, brilliant backgrounds. Oh my God, it's getting yes. hard, the competition. It was also the a way to, to, to catch them so we can... Look at Natalie. Oh, yes. In a garden. Derek. Oh, my God. And Derek is in his museum. Wow. <laughs> yes, yeah. very good. Thank you so okay, much. See you later. Okay, enjoy your lunch and see you later. Lunch or dinner? It doesn't matter. Don't give oh, yes. references. Or dinner. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> Until later. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye bye. See you later. <laughs>